Nash, Thorson, and other Bauhaus creationists. He tried to make this symposium as autonomous event organized by artists themselves, independent of any institutional or commercial influence. The Uwebode Symposium was intended to cons be concerned with stone, but it was not confined to stone sculpture. Rather than production of artwork as such, the focus was on communal experience and discussion. The work produced at Uwebode were mostly in the form of installation, performance, and film, and many were made collectively. There were 37 participating artists from nine countries. There was no structured program for the symposium. It was up to the participant to propose a program which was discussed and decided on by the group as a whole. The symposium was to end after 100 days, but an unexpected incident brought Ubeboda to public attention. Polish artist Teresa Murak Earth artwork titled Parallel Balance was destroyed by the local government for defacing the property. Such a violent intervention by the local authorities to an artist-run symposium and their destruction of artwork attracted attention, not only in Sweden, but also in Germany and other countries. In protest, many of the artists who were still in Ubeboda decided to remain there in support of Nakajima. As a result, even after the initial 100 days were over, the Ubeboda commune and art activities there continued for the next three years. Various Ubeboda meetings were organized in other parts of Europe and even in Japan. And in 1977, Uweboda artists were invited to the sixth documenta as Uweboda in Kassel. Many artists came to visit the Uweboda commune. Al Hansen, an American Fluxus artist, came to stay there in the mid-1970s. Nakajima called Uweboda a station, where artists from all over the world came, exchanged ideas, and went their own ways. Nakajima is a unique case of an Asian artist taking a central role in not only artistic, but also socio-political movements in Europe. Moreover, he achieved this without any public support and with very limited language skills. He actually speaks Japanese only and a little bit of English. So it seems that uh, it he just jumped into the European avant-garde and was instantly accepted there. What made this possible? For one thing, Nakajima and avant-garde artists and activists in Northern Europe shared an anti-establishment ethos expressed through direct action. Nakajima's intuitive dumb acts perhaps didn't have any clear political message but were intended to disrupt the routine of everyday life. Secondly, some of the artists and activists in Northern Europe had started to question the Western-centric views on art, philosophy, and history by the time Nakajima arrived there. The Provo, Bauhaus creationist, and Uweboda commune artist seems to be concerned with ecological issues and maybe saw Eastern philosophy as an alternative to Western modernism. This perhaps contributed to their warm reception of Nakajima and his intuitive, but sometimes incomprehensible actions. At the beginning of this talk, I referred to the perhaps oversimplified idea of a one directional transfer of ways of doing art from West to East. I would suggest that Nakajima's work represent a transmission of ideas in the opposite direction. Nakajima's early street actions were, as Panamarenko made clear, inspirational to some European artistic practice and not derived from Western practice exported to Japan. 
Finally, in Japan at that time, street action, whether street protest or a way of doing anti-art, was conceived as a new method of questioning and resisting the status quo. In this, Japan was not playing catch up to Europe or America. And I would say that in both the protest and artistic spheres, and of course there is no clear-cut distinction between these, the informational flow between East and West in the 1960s was in two directions rather than just one. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshiko. And, and finally, uh, we, uh, we, we welcome uh, Rosemary Candelario, who uh, is a uh, assistant professor of dance at Texas Women's University, uh, a graduate of UCLA uh, with a degree in culture and performance from uh, 2011, I believe, uh, and uh, who was also a co-organizer co uh, with, with me uh, some years ago, I think 2011 actually, of the uh, uh, UCLA's own uh, Butoh Forum uh, in, in conjunction with Red Cat downtown. Uh, and uh, I'm also pleased to announce that her, her uh, manuscript uh, and future book, uh, Flowers Cracking Concrete, Eiko and Coma's Asian American Choreographies uh, has just, perhaps today, received a green light from Wesleyan Press. Uh, so uh, congratulations are in order. And we welcome Rosemary Candelario. Thank you for having me and thank you for that lovely introduction. And rather than feeling like all the preceding papers are hard acts to follow, I'm gonna take them all as wonderful, rich um, context in which to consider um, the dance that I'm about to talk about. Um, and usually when I'm presenting to dance folks, I have to present so much, much of this context that we've already heard today. So it's really wonderful to be um, thinking about dance in the context of music and literature and film and um, performance art um, that's already um, going through these similar processes. Twenty years ago, we were crazy, dirty, and mad. Those words, the title of a 1986 essay in TDR by Bonnie Sue Stein, are how many English language speakers outside Japan first were introduced to Buto. At the time, the form was still quite new to audiences outside Japan, having only been in the international spotlight a few years since Kazuo Ono's performance at the Nancy International Theater Festival in 1980 created a sensation and brought critical attention to the quote-unquote new avant-garde dance from Japan. Published the year of Hijikata Tatsumi's death and only a year after the first Buto festival in Japan, Stein's article provided a needed orientation to the dance, albeit one that leans towards essentialism. For example, she emphasizes in her article what she sees as the impenetrability or mystical nature of Butoh writing, quote, the work of these Japanese artists is so thorough and so Japanese that Westerners sense a searing honesty. Spectators who may not like it still respect the experimentation and the performance skills required, end quote. Accurate or not, assumptions of an essential Japaneseness often accompanied the dance, especially on its international travels. Thanks to a revised version of this essay in the um, text Moving History, Dancing Cultures, a Dance History Reader, those words, 20 years ago we were crazy, dirty, and mad, continue to introduce dancers to Butoh, often in undergraduate dance history courses. But it's really interesting to note that the original article in TDR, while highlighting Butoh's two central figures, Hijikata and Ono, also includes information about and many photographs of companies like Sankaijuku, Daire Kurakan, Eiko and Koma, and Natsu Nakajima, all of whom at that time had performed to critical acclaim in the US, primarily in New York. The overall impression is one of vital, active, and very importantly, international dance community. 
And incidentally, all of those dancers are still active. Though to be clear, Eiko and Kalma have never used the term Butoh to describe their work, and Mintanaka has since rejected it. But the second uh, version of this essay, in Moving History, Dancing Cultures, is revised to only focus on Hijikata and Ono, and ends with, a, with an account of Hijikata's 1986 death, thus providing a more fixed and finite history to, to, uh, for Butoh. The quotation from Nakajima Natsu, abbreviated in the title of the article, has quite a different import in these two different cases. In full, Nakajima says, quote, 20 years ago we were described as crazy, dirty, and mad, and now we have a passport. In the 1986 essay, this gives a sense of how a once marginal performance form is now circulating globally with all the excitement and risk entailed in this newfound mobility. In the 2001 version, however, the phrase 20 years ago seems to fix the form in the past as something already finished. Instead, the opposite is true. Butoh continues to flourish, constantly attracting new dancers, audiences, and scholars around the world. So my concern today is to develop a way to think about Butoh's history and contemporary practices that frames the passport that Nakajima spoke about as formative rather than incidental to Butoh. At the same time, I do not wish to gloss over the essentialism that characterized Stein's um, sorry, that characterized Stein's and many other critics' initial reception of the form, and I should say continued reception of the form. What does it mean for Butoh to have a passport? How does it migrate? Where is Butoh granted entry? When Butoh is adopted and adapted from people from different geographic, cultural, and sociopolitical backgrounds, what exactly is being transmitted? In light of Butoh's continued, uh, continued migrations over the three decades since Stein's original article, it becomes urgent to address these questions. In what follows, I point briefly to the international influences on the form's development. I then propose three mechanisms that characterize Butoh's international circulations, which I'm calling Butoh diasporas, Butoh pilgrimages, and new local Butohs. I illustrate each with examples of contemporary dancers who exemplify and also complicate both Butoh's roots and its roots. And the implications of such an approach, I hope, uh, include an attention to what dance might be able to tell us about 21st century uh, cultural flows. And moreover, in setting my sights outside of Japan, uh, on Butoh outside of Japan, I seek to illuminate the stakes of the extension, revision, and recontextualization of this form's legacy. I'll give a little bit of history, which I'm sure most of you know, but just to sort of set this in the, um, set the stage, as it were. Um, Hijikata's 1959 dance, Kinjiki, or Forbidden Colors, which was a duet with Ono San Yoshito, and loosely based on the homoerotic Mishima Yukio novel of the same name, is considered by many the first Butoh performance. But one could, however, argue that the history of Butoh began long before 1959. As Francoise Lyonnais and Shumei Shi have noted, quote, cultures are always already hybrid and relational as a result of sometimes unexpected and sometimes violent processes, many of which we've already heard about here today. In Butoh's case, the form only could have developed in the wake of the circulation of ideas and bodies between Japan and Europe, again um, described um, here today, in particularly um, uh, Ono and Hijikata both trained in, in modern dance in Japan with teachers who were heavily influenced by training in Germany. And so they were influenced by the German modern dance, particularly of the 1920s and 30s, and Mary Wigman. Additionally, Ono was famously inspired as a young man by the Spanish dancer Antonio Merce, who's known commonly as La Ar Argentina, and that's uh, who his most famous piece is um, uh, considered an, an homage to. And Hijikata himself mined myths and memories of his own rural Japanese childhood, even as he drew on European writers and artists like Jean Genet, uh, Artaud, Francis Bacon, and Hieronymus Bosch. These myriad influences were processed and channeled into Hijikata's and Ono's dances alongside the influences of the Japanese avant-garde and the spirit of protest that characterized Japan in the 1960s. 
So Buto could not have developed without these established and active cultural exchanges between Japan and European countries. It's also questionable how much the dance would have grown or thrived without the global cir circulation of the form. So dancers who studied with Hijikata and or Ono began to travel outside of Japan already in the 1970s, though the term Buto itself did not necessarily accompany them. Eiko and Koma, for example, performed in Germany, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and North Africa from 1972 to 74. And then uh, Ishii Mitsutaka went to Germany around the same time, and the three of them intersected in the Netherlands in 1973, where they formed the short-lived Lindenracht Dance Laboratory. Eiko and Koma later spent six months in the U.S. in 76, and then moved to New York in 77, where they built their work as, quote, Japanese dance in the avant-garde manner. Uh, but they never use the term buto. Uh, when Murabushi Ko, Carlotta Ikeda, and Yoshioka Yumiko went to France in 1977, however, they did call their work buto. And all of these international performances were very well received, but it was not until Kazuo Ono and Sankai Juku performed in France in 1980 that the idea of buto as a specific form with multiple proponents really took hold outside of Japan. And, and in fact, in the US, you don't see that term really start to circulate until um, as late as 1984 when Sankai Juku first came. Um, so despite these international roots and uh, Buto's status as part of the Japanese avant-garde, this history was not necessarily evident to early audiences and critics in France and the United States. Instead, audiences and critics presumed that what they saw on stage somehow represented something fundamental about Japan um, or even um, something uh, kind of prehistoric. Um, uh, and, and foundational about Japan. And this kind of reception was not unique to Buto. Barbara Thornberry has argued that Japan, in quotes, has been discursively constructed for Americans since the post-war period through their exposure to Japanese performing arts, um, in particular um, through uh, kabuki. And in particular, she argues that the way these performances were presented and interpreted for audiences, American audiences, through coverage in major uh, publications like the New York Times has had an impact far beyond the actual performance halls uh, in that they produced a discourse that presents performing artists from Japan, traditional or not, as purveyors of a somehow timeless and ahistorical cultural heritage. So if Western mainstream, or sorry, mainstream Western reception of Buto conceived of the form as essentially Japanese, some Japanese scholars have made similar moves. According to Bruce Baird, for example, um, Takechi uh, Tetsuji almost immediately read Buto in terms of wet rice agriculture, while uh, Gunji Masakatsu read Buto as related to Japanese shamanism. And beyond these interpretations that tie Buto to specific aesthetic, uh, sorry, to specific aspects of Japanese culture, other discursive moves attempt to define Buto primarily within the geographic borders of Japan. For example, the Tokyo-based dance critic Kuniyoshi Kazuko has created an off-circulated and, as you can see, quite complicated um, uh, and quite uh, often cited genealogy of Buto. And this detailed lineage, which I'll give you a little bit of a close-up on here, even then it's still really hard to, to read because it's so dense. Um, uh, this detailed lineage is unquestionably a valuable document, but its linear nature assumes Japan as an originary center and an ongoing center where Buto lives. If dancers depart Japan for multiple years, they're marked with a broken line, which you can kind of see um, in the middle, uh, there's a broken line for um, uh, the Tamanos, for example, it says going to the USA, or for Ishii Mitsutaka, who I mentioned before, it says you know going to, Jap uh, going to Germany, and then when um, somebody comes back to Japan, there's suddenly a solid line again. Um, so uh, those dancers, as I uh, just remarked, who depart for multiple years, the broken line that, that um, marks them suggests a tenuous link both to the country and also to Buto somehow. Um, and what's not evident from her genealogy is the frequency and trajectory of the listed companies and dancers' travels. For example, even those listed with the solid lines like Dairo Kurikana and, and Maru Akaji are constantly, constantly traveling. And these repeated departures and returns are, are masked by the solid lines that seem to anchor them discursively to Japan. Moreover, the lineage does not account for non-Japanese artists or for Japanese artists working in sites other than Germany, France, or the US, um, such as Hatakonoko in Taiwan or uh, Wagori Yokio in Indonesia and many others. So I'm attempting to intervene in such a Buto genealogy by drawing attention to the practices that exceed 
this kind of model. So I coined the term Bhutto diaspora to grapple with this global circulation of the dance form and its proponents. The term attempts to account for the transnational movements, including touring, teaching, and extended residency of second and third generation Japanese dancers trained in Bhutto who may or may not call the, their own work by that name. A Bhutto diaspora also conveys not only the short and long-term movements of Japanese born and trained dancers away from Japan, but also the material and imagined um, ongoing connections back to Japan that they themselves might create or that might be um, placed upon them by audiences or critics or their students. So <coughs> earlier I mentioned Daido Kudokan as one of the first Bhutto groups to perform in the United States, appearing under the auspices of the American Dance Festival in 1982. Maru Okaji spent the better part of a decade participating in Hijikata's dance experiments before he founded Daira Kudokan in 1972. Early and ongoing touring of the Tokyo-based troupe and its spectacular style has given them a leading role in the Bhutto diaspora. Um, these performances have inspired countless spectators to become dancers um, and have drawn many non-Japanese dancers to Japan on what I call Bhutto pilgrimages to study at the company's semi-regular summer intensives. And you see here the, the advertisement for a summer intensive this summer. Moreover, Maro's one dancer, one company philosophy has contributed to the proliferation of Bhutto companies. His commitment to developing his dancers as choreographers themselves including pre includes presenting their work through a company within the company, while also encouraging his dancers to spin off their own companies. So beyond the sense of dispersion of Bhutto outside of Japan and to an increasing number of dancing bodies, Japanese or not, using the term diaspora also admits some theoretical complexities such as those um, that Iwabuchi Koichi um, calls recentering uh, globalization. This idea not only challenges a Western-centric model of globalization, but also demonstrates how Japan's cultural power in East and Southeast Asia works to consolidate and elevate Japanese national identity, even as it is exported across national borders. Like Iwabuchi, Leone and Shi, who I mentioned earlier, do not discount the persistence of the national in the transnational, nor do they see transnationalism as a homogenizing force. Instead, they see it as, quote, spaces and practices acted upon by border-crossing agents, be they dominant or marginal, end quote. Within this understanding, they recast the focus on minority subjects' relationships to one another rather than to a dominant power in a process they call minor transnationalism. Given Bhutto's status as a marginal arts practice and Japan's complex history as both an imperial power and a subject of American occupation and ongoing orientalization of an undeniably modern country as exotic and traditional, or as I said earlier, as somehow timeless um, and ahistorical, this dynamic horizontal orientation, I think, can be a really productive position from which to examine Bhutto. Katsura Khan provides an apt example for this kind of approach. Since establishing his multinational troupe Katsura Khan and Saltimbank in 1986, he has worked with what he calls, um, quote unquote, minority dancers in Africa, the Mediterranean, Asia, the US and Australia. Nominally based in Kyoto, he spends eight or nine months each year abroad giving workshops and performances. Khan believes that the dance can and should be globalized, but insists that this process cannot be based on the replication or imitation of a supposed Japanese body or of Japanese culture. Instead, he's advocated for the creation of new local butos that draw from the dancer's own cultural references. And what you see a picture of here is his uh, attempt to work with dancers primarily in the US uh, on creating uh, what he called the Beckett Buto, using the work of Samuel Beckett as sort of a, an analogy to the surrealism of, of Hijikata's own writing. So trying to find uh, alternate um, sources that would have kind of a similar impact on the body. So conceptualizing Bhutto and Bhutto dancers in this kind of transnational motion, acknowledged by the idea of a Bhutto diaspora, demands that we pay attention to where the dancers and the dance form travel. And I sort of mentioned those both because sometimes the form itself travels separately than actual moving bodies through things like um, YouTube videos. And uh, early on, very um, uh, centrally through um, a couple of photography books uh, in the 80s, through some documentary films. So it also is traveling sort of separate of, 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 of bodies in, in forms of media as well. 
Um, so paying attention to these movements and then um, also what happens in the locations where they travel. Um, so as it gets taken up by dancers in, in more and more locations around the world, some then seek further training in Japan through what I call a Buto pilgrimage. And I mentioned earlier in terms of um, the Daira Kudokan Summer Institute, but many, many companies have, um, have summer institutes where you can go for a week or a couple of months, and uh, some people a couple of years, in the case of Mintanaka's farm, and actually live and um, uh, uh, train in Japan in Buto. Um, and then some of those people then uh, adapt that training to their own specific cultural and geographic context through the creation of what I call new local butos. So buto pilgrimage is meant to describe dancers who, as I said, travel to Japan to seek out intensive study with Japanese teachers from a week to a number of years, after which they usually return to their home country. And full disclosure, I should say that when I was a graduate student, the Terasaki Center funded my own kind of buto pilgrimage to, uh, to Tokyo. Um, so I'm a participant in these processes as well as a, um, a scholar of these processes. Um, so the pilgrimages may or may not involve a search for the authentic. For example, you'll hear a lot of, particularly American Bhutto dancers, but I imagine European as well, will say, well, you can't really be a Bhutto dancer until you've gone to Japan. So there's a sense that you're not authentic unless you have this sort of material connection with the country. Um, my companion term, New Local Butos, provides a framework then to think about choreographers uh, who have adapted their training to their own cultural context in order to develop their own particular performance modes that work through local or personal problematics. This term points to the innovations and adaptations that are constantly being in 